Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 2 with Dan Verhoeven. My name is Donny. I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe, a place where we sit down and go really deep with some of the deepest humans on Earth. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and the fears, and personal philosophies of those who choose to adventure on one breath. The Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes and show notes can be found there. You can listen to the podcast through iTunes, the Stitcher app, and a few more. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to put the episodes up on YouTube. If you think it's a good idea, let me know. It will be audio only, of course. Just search for Free Dive, Free Diving, or Free Dive Cafe, and it should come up in iTunes and Stitcher. There have been a few teething problems getting listed with all these podcast providers, but within a week or two, it should all be perfect. If you listen to the podcast and you really like it, Please, please, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star review. You can also leave reviews on Stitcher. Go to the Facebook page and like that too. That's at facebook.com slash freedivecafepodcast. If you have friends who love freediving, share the episodes with them on Facebook and Twitter. And let's really try to build a community around the podcast. On the website, you can leave comments on the episode pages below the show notes. Let me know what you think about the show and make suggestions. If you have any comments, suggestions, or criticism, go to the website and leave a message through the contact page. So I'm planning to release a new interview at least every two weeks. I'll try to launch around the 15th of the month and the last day of the month, but remember to subscribe through your favorite podcast provider, and that way you won't miss an episode. If you love the concept of the show, if you want to see it grow and bloom like some beautiful thing, please consider supporting me in this endeavor through my Patreon page at patreon.com slash freedivecafe, or you can just hit the support the podcast button on the site, and that'll take you to patreon.com. I'd love to be able to grow the Free Dive Cafe into something bigger and better. I'd really love to do a Q&A episode with a returning guest once a month, so I set a goal on Patreon that if I reach 50 patrons, I'll do that. I'd love to eventually have some video as well as audio on the site and generally produce more educational freediving content. This is only going to happen if I can generate some funds. So if you love the show and you want to help, consider pledging a dollar or two a month. Every cent is appreciated. On today's episode, we have Dan Verhoeven. Dan was born in the Netherlands and he now lives in uh, Cornwall in the UK. He's something of a legend in the freediving world as an underwater photographer. He can often be found at big competitions, hanging around under the surface, capturing some of the best images we get to see of freedivers in action. He started freediving in 2005. He started competing in 2006. Between then and 2011, he set national records in five of the six disciplines. He's a freedive instructor for IDA, SSI, and PADI. He's an IDA judge. He was voted Safety Freediver of the Year in 2010 and 2011. He has been a dedicated freediving photographer since 2011, and that's what he does full-time now. He lives with his girlfriend, freediver and UK national record holder Georgina Miller, and their two dogs in a house by the sea. And Dan joined me from there in what was a very fun and relaxed conversation. We talk about underwater photography, of course, and the logistics of filming all day underwater on one breath. We touch on the potential of yoga and the meditative aspects of freediving. We talk about the public perception of freediving, Dan's favorite dive sites, and the role of freediving in educating the public about ocean conservation. And of course, we talk about Peter Gabriel. You'll just have to wait and see what I mean. Okay, let's dive. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the invite, Donnie. So you're actually in uh, Cornwall in the UK right now, is that correct? 
Yes, I'm uh, near Falmouth. So when I look out of my window, I can see the sea and a quarry and a ship being loaded. So when I when I think about free diving and when I think about the UK, I don't really I don't really put the two together. You know, it doesn't paint a compelling uh, free diving picture for me. But I understand uh, you actually have a school there. So is the, is the diving actually quite nice? Well, yeah, I I used to have the same idea about free diving in the UK because um, I started free diving in Holland, which is I think the association with free diving in Holland is like you dive into mud. Right, yeah. which is pretty much true. Like you have nothing deeper than say thirty meters, and it's brown water. But um, and I thought of the UK was going to be similar, but actually we're in the Atlantic. It's on the greenish side of things, and it's on the cold-ish side of things. But right now, the like the water is sixteen degrees. We've got um, like a five-minute boat ride out of here. We've got fifty meters, sixty meters. Um, our shore dives are with kelp, lots of fish. Um, you know, you can like I was playing with seals uh, less than a week ago. So actually, there's there's a lot of things to do here, and there's like besides the nice shore dives, there's yeah, there's also depth. So I, I was pleasantly surprised. It's still the Atlantic, so it's still you know a, a pretty rough ocean, but um, it's it's better than we than I than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I saw like a, a documentary not too long ago. I think it was uh, Baird Grills and um, he was in that area too, in the Irish Sea kind of area and was kind of explaining that because of the um, the, the, the way the currents are, uh, the water is a lot warmer than people actually expect and actually has a lot a lot more interesting sea life than people would expect too. Exactly. Whereas, um, um, the, the Gulf Stream is passing by here, so it never gets really, really chilly. Like the coldest I've had here was 11 and the warmest is about 19, 20. So it's not, uh, not as bad as you think. I think like in the, in the midst, the midst of summer, you can kind of get away with a three millimeter. So you can actually, you can actually do some training here. I was really pleasantly surprised by that. And there's no thermocline because, you know, mad currents and everything. So everything is nicely stirred up. Yeah. I think if you're going to be anywhere in the UK, then it's best to be as far south as possible. So you, you got that part for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's also also true from the sun and climate point of view, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I'm from Scotland originally, from? so. Um, oh, poor man. Yeah, it's uh, it's this, free diving in Scotland is something that I would not really imagine doing under any circumstances. But I'm lucky enough to live in a place like Taiwan, so I don't have to think about it. But if I ever have to go back, then I probably will end up free diving in Scotland. But, you know, I've seen some lovely footage from freediving in Scotland of, um, yeah, yeah, because the, the basking sharks are now they're heading up north a little bit more because it's getting too warm for them here. Like Cornwall used to be known for its basking sharks, but they're getting like, it's getting too warm. So they're up in Scotland, Ireland. So and there's nice seal colonies there. So there is there is some. But I wouldn't go into a lock or something to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for depth. Because that's just. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's a different story, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's just uh, go to. Um, I saw that you studied um, communication arts in New York. Is that correct? You were a graphic designer. You studied graphic design there. I didn't. I never really studied graphic design. I kind of rolled into graphic design. But part of my. Uh, yeah. Part of the, the studies was. Um, an elective part was uh, Photoshop, but this was back in like early 2000. So there was like a very primitive form of Photoshop. But yeah, I, I kind of connected with that because I always wanted to be a photographer, but um, I got rejected from photography school. <laughs> like I, I applied to it and they, they were like, they looked at my portfolio and like, nah. So um, I didn't get into um, photography school, but it always like stuck in the back of my mind i want to do something with pictures so photoshop was the next best thing so yeah so i kind of rolled into graphic design that way so did you and and from there did you go quickly into photography no i took a really long detour um so i studied in new york and i had a job in new york and then i got a call when i actually was on the phone with my father and um, he was complaining about being dizzy. And I told him, like, oh, you should see a doctor about that because he wasn't normally dizzy or normally nauseous. 
So um, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing my heart specialist in like three months. I said, ah, you know, maybe see a, a doctor sooner. So he went to see a doctor and the doctor sent him to a hospital and they did tests and the test, like they took a picture of a, a brain scan and there were dots on his brain scan and that's never a good thing. So um, my family called me to say like there's, there's spots on his scan and, and it, he probably doesn't have long. So um, I was on the plane the next day back home and um, for the next five years I took like he he only had two months after that. So um, after that, I kind of took it upon myself to uh, conserve his legacy because he was a writer, a philosopher, and um, he wrote more than 80 books. So part of my inheritance was, you know, um, 80 books and, and countless of articles. Mm -hmm. Your so father I, was uh, Cornelis uh, Verhoeven, correct? Cornelis Verhoeven, yes, exactly. Yeah, so very, a very well-known uh, Dutch uh, philosopher. Well, yeah, yeah, as far as philosophers can be well-known. I mean, <laughs> I always ask people, like, can you name me a contemporary philosopher from your country? Like, and they kind of go like, uh, no, you know, it, it, philosophy is one of those fields that is well known amongst philosophers yeah 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 well known in the philosophers known. world yeah exactly but he was well known enough where um like when he when he passed away it was on the news you know and it was in the newspapers so he, yeah it made a bit of a a, a, a an impact there uh, it made a, a massive impact on me so for the last next five years i was involved in the book world and that's kind of how i got into um graphic design as well because, um, yeah, I started designing or like doing layouts of books and designing books because of I, w I was already involved in that. I was publishing unpublished books that he'd written, that kind of stuff. So you kind of I kind of rolled into it that way. It's a really long answer to a very simple question. Sorry. Did you get into freediving before that? What, which came first, freediving or photography? So... Well, okay, so photography was in a way first. I got rejected from, from photography school. I stopped photography because of that, because I made that mistake of like thinking like, oh, that means I'm not a photographer, you know, which is a really silly thing to to think. But um, but then I started freediving again, in, or I started freediving in 2000, when was it, 2005? And because I started freediving, I started traveling the world. So you started in 2005, so you started, you actually started quite late in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was 31. Yeah, it was really late. I just, one of those things, I got, like, oh, I wish I'd discovered this sooner, you know, because I was always doing it. It was one of those things, like, I think most free divers have this. Like, they, they, when they were, as kids were in, in a pool, they were playing on the water, yeah, you know? Yeah. Because they love that feeling of flying and, and being on the water. So I always had that, but I never knew that that was a sport, you know. And I'd seen the Grand, Le Grand Bleu, uh, the, the Big Blue. Of course, I'd seen that, but that was madness, you know, to sit on a sled and go down. That's no, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, that didn't appeal to me at all. But then, um, yeah, because of free diving, I started traveling more. And because I started traveling more, I, I needed to let my mom know that I was safe, you know. Um, so I had to um, get a cell phone. I've always... I've always hated cell phones. I've always hated the phone in general. But um, I had to get a cell phone. And the cell phone had a little camera, tiny little camera, but it was kind of fun to play with that. And that kind of got me back into photography, you know, from the tiny little cell phone camera again to a compact camera, DSLR. So your first camera was actually a cell phone camera? My first camera was a Nokia. <laughs> <laughs> 1.2 megapixel Nokia, yeah. <laughs> so in in a sense your photography and your free diving kind of uh organically grew out of each other yeah 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 it's uh, um i mean the, the photography was always there and looking back on it the free diving was always there as well but um yeah and it took me a long time it took me six years to combine them because it was one of those things like my dad said i like mayonnaise and i like licorice but i don't necessarily like a combination of the two you know i was um i wasn't sure if i was gonna like that combination but as soon as i tried it i 
yeah, something, yeah, it it really clicked. So where did you do your first, uh, if you did one, where did you do your first free diving course? Who did you do it with? Who who introduced you to it, like in the sense of a more uh, more of a discipline and a sport? Right. I remember this thing. It was 2005. There was a guy in Holland called Bill Megans. At the time, he had the Dutch national record with like an astounding five minute and four second breath wow. hold or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you believe it? Unbelievable. Uh, he was, um, I'm not sure if he was an official freediving instructor. He was definitely a dive dive instructor. And he'd, like, he'd taken a course with um, Umberto. So, and and, and I did um, an introduction with him. So it wasn't an official course. It was just an introduction to static. But that taught me the basics of, like, taking a full breath. But the major thing that taught me was that, you know, that feeling you have when you think you're dying, that's just CO2. It's not O2. You still have plenty, plenty of oxygen in your body. And that realization really relaxed me and really uh, allowed me to um, start pushing myself a bit more. And I did that course together with a friend. So because I had a, a, a buddy already there, we could go to the pool and then go, um, yeah, go a little bit crazy. Looking back on it, it's not ideal because I wasn't taught any rescue skills or any other of the skills, but um, that didn't come until like a year later. I did um, my two-star with Katja Kederbach, who's a German freediver in a lake in Germany, and then three-star with um, somebody in Egypt, and then four-star an instructor in Greece. and Yeah, so I kept rolling that way. But I was one of those stupid guys who did a lot of um, a lot of free diving without any instruction. So you build bad habits, and I'm still struggling with like <laughs> getting over bad habits now. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't advise anybody to go down that the, down the track that I went. Now it's funny that you say that you know like um, that you didn't learn about safety in those uh, when you originally learned about free diving. I think that. You know, that was um, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now. It, so much has changed in freediving in the last 10, 15 years with the, the courses becoming so much more popular. And I think safety is obviously a lot more in the, in the, in the front of people's minds these days as well. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, in the Swedish system, they don't, there's no performance requirements other than you have to be able to rescue somebody from 10 meters in the first course. So you don't have to do a specific depth, but you have to be able to rescue somebody. So that that makes the, the, the focus, and I love that about that system, that makes the focus about system and about uh, about safety and about, yeah, not so much about you. It's about you as a, as a, as a team, you know? It's about you as part of a team and uh, how good a safety can you be for somebody else. What is the name of the organization, the, the Swedish organization that... Um... That's the... Swedish, uh, well, they, they are the, the, in Sweden, the IDA and CMAS were, came together. I forget their official name. The Friedrichsweden, uh, ja, hip, 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 So I don't know, man. Okay. The Swedish, <laughs> uh, the Swedish Um, uh, the meatball organization. I don't know. But the, it, it is a lovely system because I think, yeah, that's where the focus should be, shouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Like freediving is one of those sports where I always say it's not an individual sport. It is a team sport because there's no way you can do it safely by yourself. It's kind of one of the few sports where you, you're almost completely alone, but at the same time, you all, you completely rely on somebody else at the same time, you know, because you exactly. always die on your, yeah, you always dive on your own, but there's always somebody there with you. Yeah. In a way it's both. The, it's the loneliest team sport in the world, you could say. Right, right. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Because, yeah, at depth, you're all by yourself. And there's, <laughs> there's nobody there with you. But you wouldn't get there without somebody at the surface watching over somebody you. Somebody looking down on you, yeah. You worked your way through the, uh, the, the levels, the free diving levels and the courses. And eventually, you became an instructor. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, certainly know about you as the uh 
the free diving photographer, but not many people know that you actually ended up um, uh, attaining many Dutch records. <laughs> yeah, but that's because, I mean, national records in, in free diving, in a way, they, free diving is such a small sport that you should look at it globally. So a national record, and especially in a tiny country like Holland, where <laughs> people aren't really doing it, it's, yeah, it's kind of like... Right, so Dutch Dutch people are so tall, so they have a they have an advantage as well when it comes to depth. Yeah, and we're really good swimmers as well. I <laughs> yes. mean, we have, uh, yeah, really really good swimmers. But um, as free divers, we used to be really crap, and now um, the men are still quite crap. The women are world class. We have two world record holders, female world record holders in Holland. So the women are much deeper than the men, which is one of those things that I liked about free diving. Also in the beginning, like. When I started, the deepest person in the world was Tanya Streeter. You know, she did 160 meters, no limits. And it's kind of like, oh, that's that's so cool that, uh, you know, uh, that women are kicking our asses in this. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the national records, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I never took, I never really took pride in that. Other than, I have to say, the first, time i broke a national record was uh, a cnf record so depth no fins and all of a sudden i realized i had this weird realization that i am the deepest man in holland in this category and my dad was the deepest man in holland in his category you know i'm the deepest physically and he was the deepest metaphysically intellectually uh yeah exactly and i love that idea so because of that 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 was a fun thing but you know other than that it's not like you know all of a sudden there's newspapers and groupies and a massive sponsor contracts or anything like that it's you know, nobody gives a shit and just out of curiosity how how deep was the cnf record that you uh that you broke oh it's embarrassing my first cnf record was 36 meters <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> yeah so it wasn't impressive at all it's like it's like what we would consider a warm-up now yeah yeah and i i, I thought it was funny because i announced it <laughs> and the deepest i'd done is one of those two okay this is how stupid a free diver i was so i announced 36 no fins in 2006 the deepest i'd ever done was 35 the day before which was with fins <laughs> 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 and i kind of figured like ah oh, well if i can if i can equalize it i can swim it and I thought it was just funny because the guy after me was also Dutch and he was going to go for 37. So I thought, oh, that's funny. I'll have like a national record for five. For five seconds, for five. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like the guy after me was much more experienced than I, but he was so nervous and he had, like so dehydrated and he he'd not slept. And so he comes up and he, he blacks out. <laughs> so then I actually actually had the record. Ever since I like I, I managed to push it uh, to fifty five, which was fifty five no fins is kind of kind of respectable, I guess. It's ha it's it's half the world record, but you know it's. Uh... But uh, William's a little bit of an anomaly in that sense, I think. Yeah, he's special, that kid. But yeah, I always like I always, like that's what, uh, your your question was about national records. Uh, I never really looked at. Um, it's kind of a philosophical thing, isn't it? Like, where do you set your norms? Do you set your norms where, like, the statistical average is? Or do you set your norms by what is the best possible? And for me, the best possible in, well, in Holland, that doesn't really count. The best possible in a small sport like freediving was global. That was, at the time, 60-something meters. So, I, yeah, I didn't think that that was, like, a 36-meter dive was that big a, an achievement. Plus, I'd only been doing it for a year. And, you know, you can't master something in a year and you can't. So I I, I, I didn't really take much pride in that uh, dive, other than the fact that all of a sudden I was the deepest guy in Holland for some reason. And do you still do you still have any aspirations for a competition? Would you still train for that? Ah, oh, you bastard. Yes, of course. Ah, there's that scene in, I think it's in Rocky six or seven or rocky 12 where he says that he still has like some 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 stuff in the beach <laughs> you know <laughs> so <there's>, uh, <laughs> you know I like, well, what kind of stuff so there's stuff yeah like yeah i don't feel like i've ever really explored my um 
my limits. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so we're going to cut to the scene of you uh, running up and down the stairs and uh, <laughs> boxing and uh, the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's, no, yeah. There's always the itch. Maybe not so much in pool. Like I was doing aesthetic the other day, and I'm. Every time I do aesthetic, I just lay there and go like, "Why am I doing this? Like, I don't really want to do that." With a dynamic, it's a little bit different because it's a a nicer feeling and it's a more interesting challenge in a way and i have a feeling that i can do better than what i've done so far like i kind of i have a feeling that somewhere in me there's a there's more than a 200 meter dynamic you know like i 175 and that was clean as hell I, yeah and that's just one of those things where you can go like okay there's more in there but with depth yeah every time every time i'm at a depth competition there's that itch and there's that because it's so lovely, the free fall. And imagine, like, if you like do a dive to like say something interesting, like ninety or a hundred, you have more than a minute of free falling. What that minute must be like? Oh. So, are you actively training for that just now? Is uh, is that a big part of your day to day life? No, not at all. Um, my, you know, my free diving in day to day life almost always involves either a camera or me teaching or coaching like no you know in order for me because i was one of those i'm one of those free divers who squeezes quite easily especially 40 50 and that's also one of the reasons i stopped because i and that's not the way i wanted to dive and like i stopped in 2011 and the culture was still very much back then was um like oh you squeeze you take a day off right yeah you push through it it's just like a nosebleed you know they, they thought it wasn't important but to me, it always felt scary, unnatural to like be bleeding from an organ. I always thought like that's kind of serious, and I don't want to do that. Because I also remember like, as a as a teenager, I I used to play basketball, and I had a, a knee injury, and I just kept playing, and that really messed up my knees. Like I, to this day, I have bad knees because of that. So that kind of gave me that warning of like, okay. Like you have an, and I have a nature of pushing things a little bit too far and going too hard, <clears throat> and that can actually damage myself. And I, free diving is such a big love in my life that I don't want to damage myself because then I can't free dive anymore. So I decided to take a step back, and then you know, a couple of years later, we we realized like how serious lung injuries and lung squeezes can be. So now I'm I'm really careful to to not injure myself that way but if i were to go back to training that would involve a lot of like lung stretching and a lot of stuff that i i, I don't really enjoy doing <laughs> yeah well that's that was going to be my next question was um you know if you were going to be training specifically for free diving what what kind of training that would you would do you do other training besides the uh free diving itself would you do like you know yoga crossfit you know running anything like that yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 path to depth is being laid out as we speak, pretty much, right? Like, there's the trailblazers are there, and and they've shown us, like people like William and people like Guillaume and people like um, Alexei, they've shown us the way to do it, which is yeah, a combination of all those mm -hmm. things. Like Cross training. You, you, yeah, it's it's not enough to just dive deep you have to build up towards it you have to um you have to build muscle by yeah cross training seems to be the most effective way to do it you have to be flexible enough and yoga seems to be a way to do that you know right you right. have to have a certain diet um in order to feed yourself because you're putting yourself under enormous duress so yeah you have to be very holistic ab about that so that yeah that would be the way for me to go about it the thing is i'm uh, i'm either too lazy or don't quite have the time or the dedication for it or like oh i think most free divers struggle with this like if there's there's always something else in the background isn't there like we all have to make make money <laughs> yeah i mean you're also the way i mean i guess the way that you're making money as well now is actually always being in the water as well and diving so it's uh that must be it must be pretty tiring actually but there's yeah there's there's no way to combine what i do for a living with 
deep diving because some people say like oh you just like you know don't why don't you go to a competition do the first dive and then photograph the rest of the guys but it's kind of like no no because you know what it's like if you've done a deep dive you want to lay on the beach and 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 drink rehydration tablets and and and, and put protein shakes and and do nothing for the rest of the day you know an 80 meter dive will take it out of you yeah i I couldn't combine that with with doing a whole competition on uh, photography so when you're at a competition how how deep are you actually diving when you're taking these amazing photographs um not so deep actually um usually between 10 and 20 that's that's kind of where i keep my office if Every once in a while, I get the itch to like do something deeper to get like more of a background or something like there's too many photographers in that area already. So you go a bit deeper, but I try not to go below 30, I'd say, because I can't do I can't really do repeat lives to 30 that much. Like I can do five, but then, you know, my legs are spent, but like 15, I can do all day long. So. And you have to think about long term, you know, most of these competitions are a couple of days long and, you know, you have to you be able to use your legs on the day two and day three as well. So. Right. so how many how many dives would you estimate you actually do on a day of competition? Well, it depends on the size of the competition. At Vertical Blue, it was where well, you have usually 25, 26 people on a day. So then you do 25 times two. So that's about 50 dives a day. The longest I've ever done was the last day of Cyprus in 2015. There were so many people diving that I ended up doing more than 80 dives. <laughs> but that was the last day of the competition. So then you can go all out and, you know, you don't need your legs the next day. So, <laughs> you know. Have a good rest the next day. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the next day is also like the hangover day because that's. <laughs> <laughs> After the party. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, free dive parties are. Oof. Can you explain a little bit about the uh, logistics of photographing a free diving competition? Hey, what, t- tell me, what kind of gear do you use, um, and what's it like maintaining it and and using it? Ah, okay, yeah. So I use um, a, a Sony Alpha Seven R Two. I think that's the official name of the damn thing. Um, with um, a 16 to 35 millimeter lens or a 20 millimeter lens and they're together in a housing by Nauticam um, so on a logistical basis every morning I have to put that housing together with the camera inside it I have to remember because <laughs> I sometimes don't I have to remember to put the SD cards in it and the SD cards have to have memory on it because it's pretty annoying if you uh if you discover that you've forgotten to do that when you're uh, in the water <laughs> yes and that's happened a couple of times uh what's also happened is that i've let left the lens cap on the lens which is <laughs> not so very clever uh, the battery sometimes isn't charged yeah, entirely yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've that's that too. all the, yes exactly well so all, all these mistakes i've made um so logistically, it's usually like in the morning, I have this mental checklist of, okay, camera is charged, memory card is in, and I take a couple of test photos to see if everything is working. I'm lucky enough with the housing where it has like this control light when, when it's green, you can pretty much guarantee that, you know, it won't leak. So I don't have to worry about that as much anymore. And then afterwards, um, you have to rinse the housing, so I tend to put it in a bucket and submerge it into fresh water. That's usually for about half an hour or something like that while I have a quick lunch. And you have to dry it, get the memory card out of your, yeah, open it, get the memory card out of your camera, make backups of the memory card, make another a backup of the backup, then import the photos into Lightroom, start editing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the editing is uh, the, the 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 logistics of it are the boring part, but it's yeah it takes up most of the day actually. Yeah, I imagine that after a competition as well, you're inundated by messages from divers who want to get a hold of the images, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's usually um, within 
like half an hour of coming home, there's a couple of people going like, "Do you have my do you have my photos yet?" It's like the camera is still soaking, and like, I haven't even liberated the card yet. So yeah, usually, but that's that's nice because it's just people being enthusiastic and people be wanting to see their uh, wanting to see their stuff. But I usually tell them I I'll, 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 I I can usually do the edit by the end of that day. So I come home at say. 1 30 or 2 and then by 2 30 i'm starting to do uh, the edits and then usually by 10 or 11 i'm I'm done with the with all the edits and i can i can send them out if people need them do you film too do you make video too yeah yeah i'm, I'm i can never make up my mind what i want to be when i grow up so <laughs> um i love filming but i'm usually there for photography but i i've I'm cheating. I I put this little GoPro on top of my dome, so for some dives I can I can take pictures. But the GoPro is running, so you take uh, you you're doing film as well. And some dives, um, like when the athlete asks me, "Can you film this one?" Then I I film on the big camera, which is a better image quality. But it's also like it's a different way of operating, isn't it? Yeah, for camera, like for photos, you're looking for like once like a split second. And you can like move the camera much more. Whereas with movies, you have to be quite smooth and stable and steady. It's not my strongest point, but it it is in a way. It's more uh, uh, in a way. It's more. Uh, is it more beautiful? I think yeah. You know, with, when you're t you're looking for a still image, perhaps you know, um, you it's almost like a chance. And, and luck that something beautiful comes out of the the moments that you're you're capturing um but if you want to make a film of something it has to be a lot more orchestrated and the way that you move the camera and the way that you swim maybe the timing has to be a lot more perfect is that do you think that's correct yeah and and like you have to be um very good for a much longer time so like when say i'm i'm photographing a competition dive. I when the dive starts, I don't have to be in the right spot yet. Like I can still move very quickly to get into the right spot where I'm in front of the athlete, where you know the light is best and everything, the background is best. I don't have to be there yet. So I can be quite jerky in my movements, I can sprint, I can do all of that. And then be in the right spot for that one moment where you click and you have like one 250th of a second where it, you are in the right spot and where everything is all right if i were to film a jerky kind of dive like that where i start in the wrong spot and i have to swim really fast you get really jerky kind of movements you don't get a smooth camera movement and it wouldn't look good at all like even that one moment where everything is right it wouldn't look good in film yeah, that that's okay if the uh, the diver is cooperating with you in the attempt to take the <laughs> they photograph. They never are. Yeah. <laughs> they never do. Free divers always turn away from you. <laughs> Bastards! I don't know how they do it, but ninety percent of the time they turn away from the light. They turn away from you. They think, "Oh, you." I don't know why I love you guys so much because you're asshole. Are there any uh, any images that you've taken that uh, really stand out for you? You know, really spectacular or just serendipitous uh, moments that you've captured? Yeah, the one that people ask me about is, um, and it's also the one that they'd like me to repeat. It's, um, I call it Brian Flies. It's, um, it's in Dean's Blue Hole, and I'm in a spot where you can see the entire Blue Hole from below. And um, there's this swimmer swimming down, no fins, wearing only Speedos. And he's really well lit. And you can see how, like, he's, it's Brian Puccella, and who's a really well built kind of dude and a really natural swimmer. So you can see, like, he's, the light hits him well. His muscles are looking good. The blue hole was looking magnificent. Yeah. It's one of my, I think it's one of my most popular images. And I love it as well. But it's so popular that I'm kind of going, like, uh, okay, I need to, <laughs> I need to do something different. <laughs> but people keep asking me to do that picture and I, I can understand why because yeah I quite love it as well I have this um, this image of uh, Tim Umigan that's very similar to that I think uh, he's diving in his uh, purple and black Oceana wetsuit 
Yes. That one added uh, that one added a big sandfall. That was nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. And just to the right of that sandfall, you see the the fish, but there's mm. something about the image it it, in a, it actually looks like the birds to my eyes. So, yeah, it looks like a seagull, doesn't it? Yeah, it's almost like a, it's almost like the the cover art for a science fiction book or something like that. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I have that actually. That is on the web. That is on the website uh, for Tim's page, which I just put up now. So, if anyone goes to the uh, to the website, thefreedapcafe dot com, and goes to to Tim's uh, interview, they'll see that image straight away. Oh, excellent! I'm glad you picked that one. I think that was one of the best ones I took this competition. The only problem I have with with that kind of stuff is it's quite similar to stuff i've done before but if it's i mean if it's a good image it's a good image so you can't really as an artist you want to innovate and you want to do new stuff of course I, yeah you can't argue with a good image and yeah I, yeah so i yeah uh, i was i was quite happy with that one as well yeah i saw you um you mentioned somewhere online about this uh I'm not sure if I say it correctly, but this uh, Devi drone. Oh, Devi, yeah. Yeah, Devi, right. So, with regards to the future of um, the future of media um, in free diving, do you think that do you think that free diving might be able to sort of take off one day on a on a on a much bigger level because of technology like this? Do you think that it will become more popular as you know, when we can really follow a diver all the way down and get these sweeping cinematic shots of the tag being taken from the bottom and following the diver all the way back up and stuff like this? Y yes. In short, the answer would be yes. And I think dive eye is it's the thing I've been hoping for. I've been hoping for somebody to to show how gorgeous free diving and especially like the free fall can be. Um, whether media have a, these kind of images have a big role in bringing free diving more to the foreground i i hope so but i i think not because if you show these kind of images to um to normal people <laughs> or to anybody who's not familiar with free diving what they're seeing is kind of static you can't really tell that they're falling you can't really it has no context for them exactly so I think ideally what you need to do with an image like that is give it context. So, for example, have computer graphics in the background compared to like falling down, say, uh, a famous building. The Eiffel Tower or something like this. The Eiffel Tower, yeah, or like um, Big Ben or something like that. And then show them the scale of what we're talking about. Because, But there's also, I think with freediving, most people are already against the whole concept of holding breath. They find that very scary. Add to that depth, deep water, darkness, people are scared of that as well. So if the dive eye will, will the dive eye help popularize freediving? I hope so, but I doubt it. I think what will popularize freediving is what we're seeing developing is the meditative yoga kind of quality. The, the the bliss of weightlessness and and this might sound very superficial but i think once people figure out that you know there's almost no better way of losing weight fast than doing hypercapnic <laughs> dynamic hypercapnic tables right so that, that's two com two completely different um uh reasons for getting into free diving there but uh equally valid for depending on who we're talking to yeah but it like will this make freediving more popular? The dive eye, I I doubt it. I hope so, but I doubt it. Um, I think what will happen is freediving will become more popular because of other reasons, which will lead to more competitions and more competitive freediving purely as a statistical thing. And because then deep freediving, we can actually show how it's done. That will become more popular then, but it won't be because of the dive eye. But once once it becomes more popular, the dive eye will be a major factor in helping it uh, keep on growing. So what would you think some of those other factors are that would increase popularity? The, the, the yogic kind of aspect of um, the meditative aspects. You can see that people are trying to, are going in that direction anyway. Like yoga is so much more popular these days than it was 15 years ago, um, meditation, mindfulness, so much more popular. Like meditation has similarities to static. 
yoga in a way has similarities to in a way to dynamic i guess but also a bit to static like you try to relax into discomfort right yeah i mean i'm personally uh, uh a practitioner of yoga and my view on this and, and and the reason almost the whole reason why i free dive is that i feel like the dive itself is almost like the the shortest sweetest most complete kind of yogic practice right because you're as soon as you turn upside down and dive into the water you're instantly put in a situation where you need to bring your mind to bring it to rest as closely as possible to complete rest yeah so within the space of one or two minutes you can have this full experience that might take it might take you years or even decades to find that kind of stillness if you try to do this on a yoga mat you know or even meditating exactly it's it accelerates that it's um what do you call that? Something that accelerates um, a chemical reaction? Or a catalyst? A catalyst. That, there you go. So yeah, freediving. I think as soon as more people start to discover that freediving is a catalyst for that kind of stuff. And freediving, I find, also holds kind of a mirror to you, doesn't it? Like it holds a mirror to your mind of like what is going on in there. And competitive freediving, yeah, I can see why that's not for everybody. Because there's a scary element to it. There's a, a strange element to it of like pushing yourself too far but you don't have to do a five minute static to experience the nice sides of it you know you can experience the, the quiet and the stillness in a minute of holding your breath and you still you still experience that kind of mirror of like okay what's going on inside of my body and what's going on with me here and what are my thoughts and what's going on now that's another thing, isn't it? It puts you in the now. Yeah, it's a very effective way to go deeper into yourself um, in, a, in a kind of accelerated fashion. Exactly. Indeed, in, in yoga, in pranayama, pranayama practices, you know, culminate in suspension of the breath. You, you, you build up to the point where you can hold your breath for long periods of time and within that breath hold actually meditate and recite mantra and concentrate on certain things so it's uh, very very closely related actually yeah guillaume said a beautiful thing about that he um he called his ted talk freediving a voyage between breaths in between two breaths you go on this voyage and that can be a mental thing it can be a physical thing it can be and you kind of determine how far and how long and where to take it but it's always a little it's always a little voyage if more people start to see this not as an extreme sport in the traditional sense of like you know uh, adrenaline and heart pumping and woohoo um uh, and screaming kind of loud kind of stuff but the other side of it free diving is still very much misunderstood by the general population Oh, yeah, very much so. I was just reading an article uh, from The Guardian yesterday. I found it online. It was about, it was from a couple of years ago about William's uh, records, one of his records um, attempts. And uh, one of the comments in the comment section just said, uh, paraphrasing here, but it just said, like, uh, the only logical conclusion to this is that you go deeper and then you die. You know, when you're, when you're inside the free diving world and the free diving community, you can understand why someone would want to do this. But to an outsider, it might just seem like the, the most irresponsible and uh, immature thing that you could wish to do, you know? It's just weird, isn't it? Because everybody knows in a way, or they know somebody who is like Mallory, who is like, you know, they see Mount Everest and they have to climb it because it's there, you know? Everybody knows about that. Everybody knows deep down that society, of course, needs people who are like that. But you don't have to do it yourself, you know. You don't have to, you know, not everybody has to climb Everest and not everybody has to set new world records or explore their limits. But there's nothing wrong with uh, not exploring your limits, but at, at least experiencing a bit of climbing or a bit of a breath hold or you know, experiencing it for yourself might not be your thing, but maybe it is, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting how how many people would accept that, you know, I, I might never want to climb Everest, but I can understand why someone else would. 
Um, mm. But then you would turn around and say, you know, like it's an absolutely idiotic thing to do to try to dive to 100 meters. But I think that's yeah. also maybe maybe part of that is to do with the kind of like instinctual fear that people have about the water and about yeah. not breathing and about the darkness. Whereas, you know, at least you can, you know, you can imagine yourself on the top of a mountain looking out across a beautiful landscape with the fresh air blowing on your face. So it's, um, it's, yeah. it's different in that sense. It's funny, isn't it? It's exactly what, um, what scuba divers usually say, because they ask you like, what do you see down there? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing to see except for like the landscape of your mind, which can be very interesting. The most, beautiful thing that I ever saw when I was free diving and I'm a still very amateur free diver but was that first time that I dived to maybe about 15 meters and I turned back up and I, I looked up I realized that I was I was in this massive massive space you know a space yeah. so big that there wouldn't be any building on earth that could be this big and you, yeah. s you see the roof the roof is the is the surface of the ocean and the sun yeah. is shining through and yes. you know, I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to be able to show that to to everybody, and then maybe they might change their tune about uh, free diving. Exactly, like when you hang there and you kind of go like, "Oh, I could be here forever." <laughs> it's such a lovely feeling, and you don't have to do anything extreme to do that. It's kind of like, "Oh no, no you can just you can experience that at five. Like I used to when I had the office job. On Friday evenings, we'd go to a local pool which had a five meter deep diving pit. You've just had a work week. You stand in front of this five meter dive pit and you just let yourself fall and you drop down to the bottom and you just lay there and you feel the work week washing off of your back and washing off of your mind. And you're just like, oh, you're free, you know? It doesn't take much for then everything to dissolve and to just go away and you're in water and you're... But I reckon most people can kind of relate to the feeling of flying that's and that's kind of weird because like that's what people are less scared of like we've all had those dreams where you're flying and it's just wonderful isn't it so i guess that's that's what will get people into free diving is flying so you know talking about looking up and seeing a beautiful uh ocean uh you know the surface of the ocean is a beautiful roof you must have been all over the world photographing free diving what are some of your favorite places to dive? What do you think are some of the most beautiful dive sites? Oh, there's so many. I mean, Dean's Blue Hole always stands out. I've been coming there for since 2011, and I'm still baffled by how perfect it is as a free diving arena. Like, there's this big hole pretty much in the beach. <laughs> You're like, it's literally five meters away from the beach. You throw a stone, and it will fall 200 meters down. And it's tucked away and protected by granite all around it. No, it's not granite. It's, um, well, it's some kind of storm. And it's protected from wind. It's protected from the rest of the ocean. There's a reef around it. There's, so that spot, yeah, that, that, that's like somebody put their finger down into the earth and went like, you shall free dive here. I mean, when you talk about, for a lot of free divers, it's like experiencing the blue. And the blue, the bluest blue I've experienced was in Sardinia. Like the, the sea there is so gorgeously blue, so deep, deeply blue, and like illuminescent kind of gorgeous, all encompassing blue that, that, yeah, that filled my heart with, with joy as well. And then uh, the Red Sea has that kind of really yellow tint to the blue because of the, I guess, the salinity and the, the, the how, how close it is to the sun. So there's spots in the Red Sea where you just kind of, oh. And there's a lake in Germany where I set my first record. That's probably why I feel sentimental about it. But it's also because it's a chalk lake. So it used to be a quarry where they dug up chalk and chalk does interesting things to water, doesn't it? Like it makes it a bit more alkaline. Like milky I think. And, uh... No, it's not. It's, it's um, clearer actually. Yeah, it's clearer. So you've got pretty good viz and it's somewhere between 
the green that we associate with lakes and the blue that we associate with oceans. So it's this aqua greeny bluey, which is gorgeous as well. And whereabouts is that in Germany if uh, someone decides to go and have a look? It's near Hamburg. It's called Kreidensee. Yeah, Kreidensee. So it's yeah near Hamburg. It's it's a oh it's a gorgeous spot. But that might be because you know I've done some of my first diving there. For the same reason, I really like Swedish waters because they have oh, I mean it's Sweden, so it's cold, but it's they have the most beautiful jellyfish there. <laughs> I hit them every day as a safety diver there, and every day I got stung by these bastards. But it was a small price to pay price to pay for like experiencing their beauty. They're gorgeous. So yeah, Sweden has a, a soft spot in my heart as well. And, are there any places that you that you still haven't been to that you would really like to see? Yeah, a million of them. Everywhere. Um, I want to go to that spot in Iceland where two continents meet. And I want to wanna dive in Japan where there's that weird structure. Okay, yeah. yeah that's actually very close to Taiwan. That's cl- closer to Taiwan than it is to uh, the Japanese mainland. It's very close to us here. Well, that one. Yeah. Take me there. And I hear, it's, uh, <laughs> I hear it's I hear it's incredibly incredibly good visibility there as well. Uh, that, that kind of stuff. I yeah, I I love that. And and like um, I was recently, I was last year in Dominica, and that was unbelievable. Like as a as a, it's so lively, and there's bubbles, and there's like, that's that's like the thermic activity there is is ridiculous. Uh, and the land itself is really lively. So then you get really nice conditions close to a place that's really interesting as well. So, yeah, yeah, there's, the, the more I do this, the more places I discover and the more places I love. But I love the diversity of the ocean as well. Like, it's never one thing. Like, even here, I never have the same view when I look out of the window. And that's just the Atlantic. Like, the Atlantic changes on a daily basis as well. You know, sometimes you have 30 centimeters of visibility and sometimes it's 15 meters. And sometimes she's green and sometimes she's gray and sometimes she's blue. And she's she's amazing. Did you ever dive with uh, whales? No! <laughs> that's, that's, yes, I want to. I, I, I've hurt them. You've I, hurt them? I've hurt them. Like, no, not hurt them as in I've... Oh, hurt them. Well, like the sound I've, I've hurt them the sound <laughs> of them, yeah. I've seen them in the distance... And uh, yeah, on February the fourteenth, two thousand fourteen, I I <laughs> I was diving just to hear whales. Like you couldn't hear them on the surface, but below five meters, you started hearing that song. So yeah, I spent a couple of blissful minutes sitting at the bottom of like at thirty meters, listening to whales. <laughs> Yeah, no, gorgeous. Yeah, I'd love to dive with you. Yeah, well, I hope that you, uh, I hope that you get the chance. Uh, you know, I was just talking to Tim yesterday about, um, you know, the the sorry state of the oceans as they are at the moment, and the uh, and how the the problem seems to be spiraling out of control. Um, you know, every time I'm in the water here, I'm picking bits of plastic out the water, and plastic is floating by, and it's just. You know, sometimes you see more plastic than you see you see fish, and uh, you know what? What are you? Uh, anyway, I know it's one of those. It seems like one of those un- insurmountable problems. But what do you think? Pos- do you have any ideas for possible solutions, or you know, things that we can do to conserve the ocean to improve the situation? Yeah, um, it's that thing where. Um... You vote with your dollar. You, the way you consume has an impact on the world, especially if you do it en masse. So, for example, if you buy water in plastic bottles, you're going to add to all that shit in the ocean. All the plastic products that you buy, a lot of it ends up in the ocean. Like little beads in uh, micro beads in your soap and everything that ends up in the ocean. Once you become aware of that, and once you be, say like, okay, I I don't want to spend my money on that. I don't want to consume that way. I'm gonna invest in uh, like I'm ha- I have this um, 
aluminum water bottle next to me, which William provided for us at, at Vertical Blue two years ago. I still have that bottle. I fill it. So, you know, bottled water is insanity. Why, why would you do that? Why would you buy that? And especially from like a company like Nestle, whose owner said like water is not a human right. You know, it's like, okay, once you start knowing those kinds of things, it's like, okay, I'm not going to put my money there. I'm not going to consume that way. You're going to have to consume something. But you have great power, especially as in numbers, in the way that you consume. So you have to be aware of where you put your vote, where you put your money, how you consume. I think that is a big way of changing or that is the, the only way of changing how corporations will do this. Because it is the corporations that are the main culprits here, of course. Right. There has but to be money change. involved, right? Exactly. It has to be a money. It would be great if we could somehow make um, make it the coolest thing in the world for everybody to have one of those pla- uh, have one of those metal bottles, those aluminium bottles. You know, like if we could, you know, all the young kids were uh, walking about, you know, with their favorite pop star printed on the side of the bottle or something like that, you know, and it was just like something that you had to have, you know? But it's, yeah, it's one of those things where I'm kind of hoping that, um, like letting more people experience free diving and seeing that how it's, it's an insult to see a piece of plastic in the ocean. It's, 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 it's such an insult. It's like, it's an affront. It's, it's like, I get so pissed off when I, when you see that kind of crap, when it defiles your your sacred space, isn't it? It's like you you don't go to a to a beautiful church and take a dump in it, do you? Um, I I also have this tendency, like people get really bleak about it, but uh, life is pretty uh, bouncy. <laughs> like it will it will probably bounce back from this, but. I mean, we're just, it, it really pisses me off when you see what, what they're destroying here. Like, I'm looking at a, a reef. It's called the Manacle Reef. It's a point here in Cornwall where, um, because of the tide movements, there's a lot of nutrients coming in and out. So this reef is flourishing here. And, but they want to build a super quarry. One, like one kilometer away from here and the super quarry would go right up to the reef and they want to build a breakwater there into the reef and there would be like heavy traffic and they'd be blasting dynamite all day long to get like the rock out of the thing and here's the ironic thing they want to get built the rock i had to get the rock to build a breakwater in swansea in wales to get tidal energy so they want to do a green, to get a green energy. They want to destroy a reef, and it's kind of like, what are we doing here? <laughs> it's like you bastards! Yeah, it's incredible. Can you, can you not understand? But yeah, most people don't go below the surface of the sea, so they don't see, they don't see the problem. They don't know that we've created a plastic ocean or a continent of plastic. Yeah, I mean, I was in the Gili Islands last year um, on Gili Trawangan, and uh, there's an organization there called Gilly Eco Trust. I'm not sure if you know about those guys, but um, they, you know, they build these uh, bio rocks. They're like, uh, you know, welded metal structures that they sink on the reefs, the reefs that which have been devastated, um, yeah, for many reasons. And they put a they put a current through the metal structures and the and then attach pieces of dead coral to them, and the coral grows grows back on the structures, and it really? grows yeah, it grows incredibly nice. quickly as well. It grows incredibly abundantly. And whenever it becomes damaged, um, it it uh, it's revived very quickly as well. It's it's really fascinating and incredible. Um, so things like this, projects like this, are definitely something that um, we need to uh, to sort of spread the awareness about. And and you know, but at the same time, it's kind of ridiculous that we have to like we're at the point where we actually have to like build the reefs and put them in the water because we don't have the original reefs there anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. Is like, why did you destroy it in the first place? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, what you said, so... I mean, that people people can't see it, and that's that's the biggest problem. They can't see it. 
Yeah. So that's why you know, every time we we have um, students, you know, I'm, I make it a habit like you do. Like you see something plastic, you put it in your belt or you put it in your suit and you take it back with you to shore. You know, and I try to encourage other people to do that as well. It's like this, this stuff doesn't belong here. And that's part, part of our, part of, I think your responsibilities as a free diver is you're, you are in an, in a kind of an alien environment. So you're in somebody else's home. You know, don't make a mess. And yeah, you're in somebody help, else's help. home, but the crap that you find floating about out there it's, is it's really from your, from home, your right? home. It's from your yeah, home. Exactly. Right? So clean up your mess. Yeah. It's um it's nice. Um usually during vertical blue and also during um the competition in Dominica there's these initiatives where you help clean up the beach. You know? You go to a beach with a couple of big rubbish bags and a couple of um you know, well you use your hands pretty much and you get as much plastic out of there as you can. I think that's really nice thing to do cuz you know when it comes down to free diving is uh, or especially competitive free diving is we're, we're we're not saving lives or anything, you know. We're doing it for fun and we're doing it. I mean, in a way, also, yeah, to explore human potential and to to show what people are capable of. But also, it's mostly fun, isn't it? So to put something a good ecological message on top of that, that's that's really nice. I guess. when we go to these competitions as well, you know, anyone that can go to a competition like this, in a sense, isn't it? privileged position right and exactly. we are doing it for fun so if you're going to take advantage and exploit the environment for your pleasure then we really need to give something back exactly i always think like if you like if you give back you you re again receive so much more anyway so it's such a pleasure to to dive in in pristine waters and there's so few of them like bahamas is supposed to be paradise isn't it and it is. It's like this beautiful white beach, and then all of a sudden, there's like it's there's, <laughs> there's toothbrushes and little plastic bags and, and weird shit floating around everywhere. You kind of go, "This is paradise. You're not supposed to be here." Yeah, but not to uh, not to get into too uh, too much pessimism on that subject. Yeah. So, like, one of the fun questions that I um, I want to ask my uh, interview guests is. Um, do you have like a personal personal routine, something that you do uh, do in the morning or in the evening? You know, is it something that you always do when you wake up in the morning? I should build up more of a routine because I think routines are one of the keys to success. So, like, success should be a habit, and habits are routines, aren't they? Um, what I've what I'm trying to do these days, or what I've been doing these days, is um, I should do more stretching. But um, I get up and I have, what's it called? Um, I'm not sure if there's a name for it. It's kind of disgusting. You take hot water with two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar and lemon juice and a bit of cinnamon. I, I guess it's supposed to alkalize you a bit or, yeah, I don't really have habits. Like in, on competition days, I usually eat like, you know, goddamn oats. Which is like, it's the downside of freediving, isn't it? Like, there's all this loveliness and there's the freedom. And then on the other hand, there's oats. <laughs> God damn oats. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? It's like eating eating cardboard. I don't know. There's a, there's a nice way to do it. You know, it's... Um... There isn't. <laughs> it's never as nice as toast. The first secret is um, <laughs> never... Never buy quick oats. You got to buy the the steel rolled stuff, the good stuff. Yeah, and then soak them overnight. Yeah, and soak them overnight, and then you got to have something else in there. You know, like maybe uh, dates or sunflower seeds. Uh, fresh mango would be pretty nice as well. Yeah, I do apple. Excuse me, apples are easy to come by. Yeah, but yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah mango season here right now, so I'm all about mangoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. But you know, it's the mango that's nice. It's the oats that's wet cardboard <laughs> <laughs> so it's oh god so yeah um but that's yeah that's a habit it's um yeah eating the oats and then another habit is to try to postpone morning coffee <laughs> it's always tricky it's funny with free diving because i started free diving i uh quit cigarettes which was a very very good thing to do and then when I quit cigarettes, after a while, I started thinking, like, okay, if I can 
do that. What else can I stop? So I stopped coffee for a while, which was not as hard as quitting cigarettes, actually. And then I tried quitting sugar. And that's the hardest thing I've ever tried. Like even after three or four weeks, I was still having massive cravings. And it just, it, it, the cravings never went away. It was horrible. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you when it comes to coffee in a way, like that's, that's doable. But sugar? That's like crack cocaine. I found that difficult as well, like giving up candy. I mean, I, I kind of had to. I, I'm at an age now where I can't take my health for granted anymore. And my body is telling me that, you know. So, um, like diet was the first thing that I kind of changed. So, yeah, no more candy and no more sugary things, even chocolate. But um, I think the next thing is, yeah, something like yoga or something where you start bending stuff. <laughs> It's just I'm six foot four, you know. I'm I'm one ninety three. It's such an awful long way down to the floor. You're six four. Like, that's uh, small for a Dutch guy, then. Yeah, yeah, I'm tiny for a Dutch guy, <laughs> but it's still tall for gravity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I have to go all the way down there and then all the way back up. It's like oh, it's such a chore. So yeah, I was never a fan of yoga, which is one of those things that you should do and one of the rituals that you should have in the morning. It's a bit of yeah, bendy bendiness but yeah i'm incorporating more stretching and strength things now so what about um what about more like uh long-term plans like what's uh or even short-term plans what's what's on the horizon for uh dan Verhoeven? are you going to be expanding your photography or do you have another project that you want to get involved in yeah there's always projects um i mean i'm, I'm still and i hope to still be a free dive photographer first and foremost for as long as I can keep it up. Um, so when it comes to that, I'm being Roatan to photograph the competition there, the world championships and Dominica for the competition there. Um, very short term. We're going to have uh, a seal trip coming up next week. So we're going to play with some seals here. Oh, a seal trip. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a, a permanent colony of seals about an hour away from here, which we're going to play with. And then after that, there's a, a trip with blue sharks, which is about an hour and a half away from here. So there's that. And I mean, there's, you know, a bit of teaching, hosting some people like corporate events, that kind of stuff. I might have to do a couple of videos for a yacht company. There's that kind of stuff. So, is there much interest in the uh, in the in, in the free diving school? Do you get many people applying for the courses? It's 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 growing. I mean, it's this is our third year. Is it our third year? No, it's actually only our second summer here teaching. And uh, yeah, it's 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 growing. Um, I wouldn't say like there's there's an enormous center in uh, in Gilly, um, free dive Gilly, and they do literally thousands of certs a day a year. I think we're lucky to if we do dozens. <laughs> yeah, I actually did my did my free diving course at Gilly, free dive Gilly. With um, who was your instructor? Um, my instructors were uh, Victor Rishetniak. I am uh, um, and uh, what was the other guy's name? Uh, Den Denny Cormano. All right. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's Mike and Kate's school, right? Um, yeah, um, uh, like Mike and Kate were our um, our housemates this year at the right. Vertical Blue, and they're such a lovely couple, and they've they've set up such a lovely business. But you know, they've, they they get obviously they get a lot of tourists walking in. We're not in that kind of um, situation, so there's almost no walk-ins for us. So we kind of have to like advertise in different ways and people try and find us. But because, you know, my, uh, my girlfriend Georgina is a national record holder. So she's a known entity and she's done some stuff on TV. And she, um, so that's how people kind of get to know us. And they like, because of my photography, people are beginning to recognize that a bit more. So we get them that way. Hopefully. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's, so that's a, a growing thing. So, that's part of the long-term plan is to 
um, keep on doing that. But that's more Georgina's. The 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 equestrian freediving is more Georgina's school and baby. And uh, for me, I'm kind of putting like vibes towards the universe where I'm I get to shoot um, uh, an underwater music video. Okay, uh, this is the Peter <laughs> Peter Gabriel thing, right? Or uh... yes. <laughs> yes, yes, let's make that happen. I have, a, I have a question written down here. It just says, uh, one of the questions here is, uh, what's the Peter Gabriel thing? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's the Peter Gabriel thing? I can't quite explain it. I, um, like it was one of those voices I, I, I hear growing up. And it just resonates with me. His voice resonates with me. I, I know some of his songs are quite granola and, uh, and uh, you know, and every once in a while he's a little bit too sincere for me as well. And he, he pisses me off. And, but I've seen him in concert. I don't know how many times every time he's, he's around, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I've got literally. Like there's my desk and then next to my desk, there's this little tower of CDs which is nothing but Peter Gabriel. And I, it's not like I listen to him every day, but every once in a while I need to listen need to, to him. You need to listen to him, you need your fix. Yeah. need my fix, and then, and, and, you know, and I know that he's working on a new album, and it's going to take him, like he does one album every 10 years or something. He's like the slowest bastard in the world. He's got way too many projects and other things going on, but like whenever I hear a new song by Peter Gabriel, I just kind of stop and, tremble <laughs> this is kind of like your master plan to infiltrate your way into the life of peter gabriel and be involved yeah, yeah, in gonna, uh, filming an underwater hash- video for yes, him you're gonna, you're gonna hashtag this it's gonna be massively popular it's gonna be like it's gonna be go viral and then he'll he'll hear about it and then go like oh and then he'll look up my show reel and go like hey uh hopefully you know, I'm sure if he saw your stuff, he would be he would be convinced straight away. I mean, I know I would. <laughs> You're very sweet. <laughs> um, I, I no no, but any like I I just because music is is one of those things like music is a passion that I can never do. Like I can't really keep a beat. I can't really I cannot play guitar or piano for the life of me. My singing is god awful. But I love it so much that, like, if I can combine, yeah, music with freediving, like, do a freediving music video, like what Ju- Julie did so beautifully for um, that um, running song, that uh, Beyonce video. So yeah, something like that. It's um, where, like, the, the 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 video really serves the lyrics and the the, the content of the of the the music as well. Yeah, gorgeous and and like. There's no better camera woman than, than Julie Gauthier. Like her camera moves the way, the way she can move in the water with a camera is unsurpassed. This is your, your dream. I really hope it works out for you. Um, you, (laughs) all the best to you. One more question, Dan. Uh, do you have a book that you can recommend or a favorite book that you would like to recommend to the listeners? Ah, yes. Um, Right, there's a writer called Christopher Moore, and he wrote a book called Fluke, or I know why the, I know why the why the humpback sing. No, what's it called? Wait, let me get it. Yeah, Christopher Moore. The book is called Fluke, or I know why the winged whale sings. And Christopher Moore is one of the funniest and most bizarre writers out there. And this is about um, whales. So anybody who is like into the ocean Mm -hmm. and into whales, it's a fantastic book. It's about an oceanographer or a a humpback specialist who one day sees a a, a whale dive and on his flu uh, on his tail is written "bite me." (laughs) 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 And it's about and it's a really bizarre book. It's really absurdist and it's really, really like he has such a mastery of language and he's so funny, but he's also at the same time such a astute observer of the human condition that I, uh, yeah, Fluke by Christopher Moore. Okay, Fluke by Christopher Moore. I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. So if uh, anyone's listening and wants to pick it up, Dan's recommended book. Um, Dan, if people want to find you online um, and on social media, where can they find you? 
on YouTube. Just type in Dan Verhoeven, you'll find me. On Instagram, I'm Dan, uh, at Dan Verhoeven Freediver. On Twitter, who the hell am I on Twitter? I think Dan Freediver or something. I don't know, man. It's okay. You I'm, I'm sure I can, I can find it easy enough and put it in the show notes. No problem. Uh, thank you, Danny. Yeah. Well, it's been really good talking to you, Dan. It's been, uh, it's been very well, good it's fun. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime later down the line. That would be an honor. Okay, thank you very much. I'll let you go and uh, attend to your uh, to your dogs and your family. Yeah, the canines have been good, haven't they? Yeah, they've been pretty good. I was just uh, uh, I think there was two or three woofs there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Thanks again to Dan for a lovely, relaxed conversation. It was super interesting, and I feel we all got to know the man behind the camera lens a bit better today. The show notes for this episode can be found on the website, episode 2, Dan Verhoeven. Don't forget to subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast provider so you never miss an episode. Okay, goodbye, and dive safe.